حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم All praise is due to Allah We praise Him and we seek His help Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one And whomsoever Allah leaves us say None can show Him guidance May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him My dear viewers Welcome to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Today, insha'Allah, um, is a new episode. It's an episode number 479. And we just had the remaining part of the last hadith, hadith number 1214. Then we wrap up the chapter, chapter number um, 216 which was talking about the excellence and the obligation of the payment of zakah. So if you remember the long hadith, hadith of Abi Hurairah, which is agreed upon its authenticity, uh, in which the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, spoke about the fate of those who hold up gold and silver and do not pay their zakah dues, or camels and they do not pay their rights, or cows and they do not pay their due rights, and then we'll start at the horses. So now, Qila ya Rasulallah. The Arabic segment again quickly, then we'll take a few vocabulary, then inshallah we'll explain the rest of the hadith. Qila ya Rasulallah, and that is the third question. Fal khayl, what about the horses? Qala al khaylu thalatha. Hiya li rajulin wizr. Wa hiya li rajulin sitr. Wa hiya li rajulin ajr. فأما التي هي له وزر فرجل ربطها رياء وفخرا ونواء على أهل الإسلام فهي له وزر وأما التي هي له ستر فرجل ربطها في سبيل الله ثم لم ينس حق الله في ظهورها ولا رقابها فهي له ستر وأما التي هي له أجر فرجل ربطها في سبيل الله لأهل الإسلام في مرج أو روضة فما أكلت من ذلك المرج أو الروضة من شيء إلا كتب له عدد ما أكلت حسنات وكتب له عدد أرواثها وأوبالها وأبوالها حسنات ولا تقطع طولها فاستنت شرفا أو شرفين إلا كتب الله له عدد آثارها وأرواثها حسنات ولا مر بها صاحبها على نهر فشربت منه ولا يريد أن يسقيها إلا كتب الله له عدد ما شربت حسنات قيل يا رسول الله فالحمر قال ما أنزل علي في الحمر شيء إلا هذه الآية الفاذة الجامعة فمن يعمل مثقال ذرة خيرا يرى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرَّ يَرَى The hadith is agreed upon its authenticity. So when the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, was asked about the horses, what are the rights in the horses, the duties and the obligations upon the person who already possesses horses and whether he should pay uh, and how much he should pay out of the horses, like the camels, like the cows, and the gold and silver, as we spoke in the uh, earlier segment of the hadith. So what about the horses, O Prophet of Allah? So he said, peace be upon him, the horses are of three types. The first is to one man, these are a burden. So the first type of the horses are a burden. And the second, to another man, a covering or a sitr. And we'll learn the meaning of the word sitr or covering, in what sense? And still to another man, a source of reward, ajra, or a reward, thawab, as we say in Arabic. So there are three types of horses. 
the position of horses will make the owners of them are three categories. The first, the horses for them are like a burden, and the second, like a covering, and the third is a source of reward. The one for whom these are a burden is the person who rears them in order to show off. Oh, wait a minute. A person who rides on their back to show off. And do you know something, brothers and sisters? What is the Arabic word of horse? In Arabic, horse is khayl. Horses are khayl. وَالْخَيْلَ وَالْبِغَالَ وَالْحَمِيرَ لِتَرْكَبُوهَا وَزِينَةً وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah says in this ayah, Al-Khayl, the horses, Al-Bighal, the mules, Al-Hamir, the donkeys. He created them for you to rear them, to ride on their backs, to use them as means of transportation. But why the Khayl were given that name Khayl? The Khayl is taken from the word Khuyala. The Khayl itself, the horse itself, walks on earth with pride more than any other creature more than any other cattle or animal. Subhanallah. So they had that khuyala, show off the horses by themselves. And the person who rides on their back, whether he is a soldier in the army, or he has horses in his ranch, or in the racetrack, is actually a source of pride and khuyala and showing off. So the person who rides on them in order to show off for them, the horses are mere burden and a source of blame and uh, committing a sin because we are forbidden against uh, showing off. And then for uh, vainglory and for opposing the Muslims, so they are a burden for him as well. Whoever is using them in order to hurt Muslims, the word niwa is vainglory. So whoever is using them to oppose Muslims and hurt them and wage war against them, then obviously it's a source of burden uh, as well. And then the one for whom the horses are a covering, a sitr. What is the word sitr? Sitr literally means covering. Hijab is a sitr. Okay. Covering and concealing one's sins is called sitr. And we spoke about the ni'mah of sitr, concealing one's sins. When Allah the Almighty says to the servant on the day of judgment, after he makes him acknowledge all his sins, he says, you know what? Satartuha alayka fi dunya. I conceal your sins for you in the life of this world. Satart from sitr or sitr. That's why the curtain is called sitar or sitara, satr, likewise. So uh, the covering here, or the sitr, is in order to cover him up so that people wouldn't know whether he is poor or rich, in need or uh, feel self-sufficient, because he's got a horse, and it is sufficient for him, so he doesn't need to ask people for a ride or for a means of transportation. Is the person who rides them for the sake of Allah, but doesn't forget the rights of Allah concerning their backs and their necks. Yani, his neighbor needs a right, somebody needs a right, jump on its back. He can lend them to his neighbors as well, no problem. So he's enjoying this means of transportation which Allah bestowed upon him. So this is a means of sit covering for him. Nobody knows his condition, whether he's in need or not, because he looks like he's well off. What is the right of such thing? To lend them sometimes if somebody is asking for a transportation or to loan them whenever people, especially the neighbors, are in need. And so they are covering for him. As for those which bring reward, these refer to the person who rears them for the sake of Allah to be used for Muslims and he puts them, okay, <clears throat> and he puts them 
in a meadow and field, in pasture, to graze, to grow up. He is feeding them, preparing them, so whenever the Muslim army is in need for them, they are there. Okay? They are there to be used. And such person, everything will be recorded for him. Whenever they graze, that will be recorded for him on his behalf as a good deed. As would also the amount of the dung and urine. Not only eating, eating and excreting. Anything that they do, their entire life cycle, the person who possesses them and is grazing them and upbringing them and taking care of them for fi sabilillah. The first, the, the one in the middle, which is a covering, he was riding on their back fi sabilillah for lawful means. But the second fi sabilillah, yani fi ribat, for the purpose of jihad, for the Muslim army. You know, in the past, there were people who would uh, walk on foot and people who would ride on the back of camels, back of donkeys, and the best of the best are the horsemen. Until today, whether in North America, whether in, uh, in, in, in Latin America, whether in the Middle East, horses are very valuable and they have a big use in the army and in the police as well. So a person who have uh, endowed them for the purpose, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there the entire life cycle of the horses will be a source of earning good deeds for that person. He's feeding them, he's rewarded. So when they eat, digest and execute, that also execution, they will be, the person will be rewarded as well, as would also the amount of their dung and urine. And these would not break their halter and brands or a course or two without having got uh, record, uh, recorded the amount of their halves uh, or half marks as their uh, dung as a good deed on his behalf. Any distance they cover, any training, as long as they're alive, as I said, their entire life cycle is a source of earning good deed for the person who's possessing them as long as it is then, and their master does not bring them past a river from which they drink, though he did not intend to quench their thirst, but Allah would record for him the amount of what they drink on his behalf as good deeds. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier, the entire life cycle, grazing, eating, drinking, uh, excreting, all of that a person will be rewarded a similar amount of good deed for him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will record for him the amount of what they drink on his behalf as good deeds. Then it was said, Ya Rasulallah, O Messenger of Allah, what about the horses? What about the donkeys? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, now we spoke about gold and silver. We spoke about camels. We spoke about cows and we spoke about the horses in in, in a lengthy explanation as the Prophet Sallallahu did then finally he was asked about the donkeys Al-Humur Al-Hamir upon this the Prophet Sallallahu said nothing has been revealed to me in regard to the donkeys in particular except what we find in this verse this verse is a comprehensive verse of Surah az zalzala chapter number 99 the seventh ayah of Surah Az Zalzala, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى Which means, whosoever does an atom weight of, an atom weight of good shall see it, and whosoever does an atom weight of evil shall see it. Which means, you and your intention. Can I say then, it's by analogy to the horses, you have plenty of donkeys, you have a big stable. So you lend them, you carry people whenever they are in need for Allah's sake on them. All of that is a source of reward uh, for you. Inshallah also we'll get to speak about the rate of the zakah whenever certain cattle reach certain number, whether camels, cows, goats, sheep, uh, and so on. But now, 
with a brand new chapter. And if you remember, we spoke in very details about namaz, the prayers, in tens of episodes, whether the obligatory prayers or the nawafil, daytime, nighttime, emphatic, non-emphatic, etc. And the night prayer. Then we shifted to speak about the payment of zakah. We covered all of that and that was the last hadith in the chapter of the obligation and recommendation of paying zakah and sadaqat. And now, I guess in order, it's time to speak about fasting or asiyam. So we're studying the book of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Nawawi in the same order that this great Imam, Yahya ibn Sharaf ibn Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, have listed the book. So in this chapter, we'll be speaking about wujubu, uh, siyami Ramadan, wa bayanu fadli siyami, wa ma ta'allaqu bihi, the excellence of observing fasting during Ramadan and its obligation and the virtues of fasting in general and some relating ahkam. Guess what? As the Imam uh, al-Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, typically he begins every chapter with a reference from the Quran, which is a greater reference if there is an immediate reference. Then he succeeds that by quoting uh, those uh, hadith. So the first reference in the chapter of fasting would be what? Obviously, uh, the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah beginning from verse number 183 in which Allah the Almighty revealed to Muhammad, peace be upon him, the obligation of fasting. All who you believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for the nations before you, for those who are before you. Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-lazina min qablikum kama kutiba ala al-lazina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon Oh, who you believe fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who were before you, the Jews and the Christians and the previous nations. And what is the purpose? Because every act of worship was prescribed indeed for a great divine wisdom. So it was summarized in one word, in order to achieve piety, righteousness, taqun, in order to be righteous, to achieve taqwa. Then he said, Fasting is not throughout the year. It's only few days every year. Ayyaman ma'dudat. Certain number of days is not much. Faman kana minkum maridan aw ala safarin fa'iddatun min ayyamin ukhar. وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون That is ayah number 184 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fasting is only ayyaman ma'dudat. Faman kana minkum maridan aw ala safar. After we say that the fasting is only a limited number of days, a few days every year. So whoever among you is sick, ill, uh, or on a journey, traveling, then an equal number of days are to be made up, which means inclusively, yeah, and you can skip fasting during your sickness and while traveling and then make them up some other time when you recover and uh, when you get home and upon those who are able to fast but with burden and hardship like elderly people, okay? Maybe they're capable to fast but that can cause any deterioration of their health or because they are old, they cannot afford it much. They can, but it will be a burden some for them. So Allah exempt them by saying, a ransom 
is a substitute. A ransom of feeding a single poor person per each day is sufficient to substitute the duty of fasting. So no one is exempt from fasting. But if, you're, if you can afford fasting but with hardship, no, don't hurt yourself. This is the, uh, you know, one of the stages of the legislation of fasting. And Allah says then, and whoever volunteers excesses, it is better for him. But to fast, it is indeed best for you. So now you've given the choice. If it causes a hardship for you to pay the ransom, to feed one poor person. But Allah says, but indeed it is better to fast. It is best rather to fast. Then the final conclusion of fasting where now it is shaped. It's during the month of Ramadan and whoever happened to be healthy and resident not traveling, they must observe fasting. There will be also another stage. We'll talk about it insha'Allah in uh, number 187. But for now, Allah says, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان The month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan has been chosen and has been blessed by Allah because the revelation of the Quran started during that month. And also we have some other verses in two different chapters of the Quran specify that the Quran was revealed or the beginning of the revelation took place on a particular night of Ramadan, not the whole month, but it was on what is known as Laylatul Qadr or Al Laylatul Mubarak. In Surah Al Dukhan, Allah says, Inna anzannahu fi laylatin mubarakatin inna kunna munzirin. Most certainly we have sent it down and revealed it down on a blessed night, which is known as in Surah Al Qadr as the grand night. Inna anzannahu fi laylatul Qadr. Then the Surah goes on and on to explain the greatness of the grand night or Laylatul Qadr. Beautiful. هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان Why and what is the purpose of revealing the Quran? A guidance of people and clear proofs of guidance and criterion for Quran to separate between the truth and falsehood. الحق and الباطل So whoever cites the moon of the month of Ramadan let him fast it. And whoever is ill or in a journey, then an equal number of other days. Allah intends for you ease and does not intend for you any hardship. And Allah wants for you to complete the period and glorify Allah for that which to which he has guided you. And hopefully you'll be rightly guided and you'll be <coughs> grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is presented in what Allah says. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ You witness in the month, you're resident, you're present, you're healthy, you're not traveling, you're not flying, you're not sailing, then you must fast. What about those who are sick? وَمَنْ كَانَ مَنِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٌ Okay, so that is the same statement. But the other one in the previous ayah, But it provides the same meaning. What to do? An equal number of days to be made up whenever you recover, whenever you come back. Why? Because Allah wants to give us ease. He wants to make our life easy. The worship is not to benefit Him. It is rather to benefit the worshiper, not the worshipped one. So if this is the case, then it is of an eminent need and of a great significance. But meanwhile, not to the extent of ruining oneself if you cannot afford it. And that's why I said, if you're traveling, if you're sick, you can skip fasting and you can make it up some other time when you recover.
And we understand from that also the meaning is inclusive. If somebody's sickness is permanent, we call him chronically ill. Halas, this person is exempt from fasting. And we go back to fafidiyatun ta'amu miskin. You feed one poor person. One of the multiple benefits of fasting, which by the end will pour into the channel of gaining righteousness and piety, one of those multiple benefits is to feel the need of those who are in need. We all know that there are some people who are sick and tired of eating meat or seafood. Why? Because it's, a, it's, it's available in abundance. They can afford it. I mean, when they go to any restaurant or dining place and they pay a thousand or two, it doesn't burden them whatsoever. It's just like, you know, a routine. While there are millions of people have never tasted meat, or they only taste it whenever it is the Eid of Eid al-Adha, whenever people give them meat as a gift of the Udhiyya. Otherwise, they cannot afford to buy meat. How would a person who is yani, feeling bored of eating meat, of eating seafood, of eating chicken, would feel the need, the suffering of somebody who is hungry and starving? It will never happen. It will never take place. Unless if you experience the same, when you starve for a little bit, when you fast from morning till evening, then when you're starving, and by the end you know that at sunset, you'll be able to eat all the delicious lawful food because you can afford it. So your fasting or your starvation is limited from dawn to sunset. But there are hundreds of millions of people whose starvations are permanent. And some who actually die due to starvation. Only then, you as a person who is self-sufficient, who has plenty of fun, plenty of food, huh, and complains of the abundance of food, only then you would feel that there are people who are really starving. You know, I, I watched once a program when somebody was asked that there are people who cannot afford uh, to buy bread. They cannot afford to buy a loaf of bread, rice, he said. They don't have to, uh, to eat bread. They can eat croissant. Uh, they can eat uh, macaroni instead of uh, pasta instead of rice. He does not get the point. Yani when we say bread, that means the basics. You know how we say that to put bread on the table. Yani food, any kind of food. So they cannot afford any kind of food. But this person is living above all. And, and that's why when he hears that some people cannot afford bread, he said, they don't have to eat bread. They can eat ice cream. They can eat waffle. They can eat whatever, you see, because he doesn't get the point. So fasting, one of its multiple benefits is to put you in that condition. Yes, you know that it's temporary. At sunset, you can eat all the delicious food you desire. Okay? All the drinks, lawful drinks you desire. But those people are living like that for months, for years, like that. They eat the leftover from the trash cans. And that's why they substitute for fasting. And to make up for fasting, if you're chronically ill, you gotta achieve the purpose of fasting through feeding one miskin or needy person. Subhanallah. Allah doesn't wanna hurt you. He just wants you to achieve righteousness and piety. He wants to give you ease, and that's why he gives you the substitute. And in order to complete the period of fasting during Ramadan, and in order to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in what sense? I guess that needs a little pause, but hopefully, inshallah, after we return from a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of the screen. I request 002 then 023 555 132. Alternatively, I record 002 
0102 then 0100546932 whatsapp numbers area code 0013478062 and finally whatsapp number area code 0013614891503 also live on the Facebook page. Marbahi uh, Batish, Batista is asking, may I ask if a woman is allowed to be uh, hair waxed by another woman? If you're asking about the areas which are permitted for a woman to show before another woman, yes. But the private areas, no, that is not permissible whatsoever. So, the Prophet وسلم, said, احفظ عورتك إلا من زوجتي. You're not supposed to show your aura except to your spouse. So any other person, unless if it is a matter of necessity, like a doctor, if you don't have, if you're a female and you cannot find a female Muslim doctor, then a female non-Muslim doctor, then a male Muslim doctor, then a male non-Muslim doctor. That is the order. So we're being very cautious. But to go for waxing, hair removal and uh, you let uh, a woman even if she is your own sister or daughter or mother because the aura before another woman covers even the maharim I'm talking about the major aura the private areas no one should see but your spouse barakallah fikum the word وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ one of the main objectives of fasting is to magnify Allah for having guided you say alhamdulillah Allahu Akbar Allah is greatest and then la'allakum tashkurun in order to be grateful to the Almighty Allah for what number one for having guiding you number two for maintaining this guidance and steadfastness that's all by the leave of Allah we normally seek the steadfastness from him we say يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك Oh Allah, the one who changes the hearts, keep our hearts firm on your religion. And uh, in a sound hadith collected by Tabarani, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was heard saying in his supplication, Allahumma ya wali al-Islam yu ahli masikni bil-Islami hatta alqaq alayh. Oh Allah, the guardian of Islam and its people, Keep me holding fast to Islam until I meet you in this condition. So this is another great blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon us. We need to say thank you Allah for. And in brief we need to say thank Allah, thank you Allah for his countless blessings, those which we are aware of and those which we have no idea of or we are unaware of or negligent of. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Whatever blessing you have, it is from Allah. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ تَعُدُّوا to count one, two, three, four, ten, a thousand, a million, a billion, ten billion, trillion. If you keep counting Allah's blessings upon you, never will you be able to keep record because they are beyond count. وَآتَاكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مَا سألتم has given you from everything that you have asked for. وَأَسْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنَةً Allah has showered you with his blessings, those which are uh, concealed and obvious. Zahira, known, seen, obvious, because we can see them. Walbatina, hidden, or at least hidden for us, or hidden temporarily. Until we miss any of them, then we realize any of them. One of the biggest calamities that can afflict any human being, one of two, is getting used to the blessings and taking them for granted. And you guys remember the example I shared with you months ago, an old man above 80 who happened to have urine retention. 
and he was literally crying out of pain. His bladder was about to burst. He wants to go to the bathroom. He goes, but he cannot urinate. Urine retention, it is toxic. It can cause toxemia. He can die as a result of that. So his sons rushed him to the ER. Immediately, the uh, nephrologist and the ER doctor, they uh, installed a catheter and it entered his bladder and he started feeling better and he smiled. His sons were very happy, started thanking the doctors, giving them their business cards, should you need anything, this is my name, my phone number, this is what I work at. Thank you for making our father feel better. And the father was crying. He said, Dad, are you okay? Are you complaining of anything else or still in the hospital? He said, I just remembered for 80 plus years, he is facilitating for me answering the call of nature, urinating and even defecating, going to the bathroom with ease. Sometimes I'm asleep and I feel the urge. I get up, I just go to the bathroom and I, and I go back to sleep. Never thought about it. Never ever thought about it. I never said thank you Allah for making it easy for me to execrate, to urinate, to defecate. Only now I just realized that it was such a great blessing, but I was out of touch. May Allah guide us to what is best. Assalamu alaikum. Ahmed from Kenya. Assalamu alaikum, Ahmed. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Brother Ahmed. How are you? Alhamdulillah, Sheikh. I'm very fine. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, uh, today I don't have a question, but uh, just a reminder there is a question I presented the previous week. Mm -hmm. What is it? Remind me, about, please. Uh, about if we may, if we can train an orphan when we are giving them tarbiya, like when we are keeping them in steadfast in prayer. So, mm -hmm. can we give them, can we train them, or this is not allowed? I want to know, Sheikh. Okay, Jazakallah Khairan, Brother Ahmed. Exactly as you train, discipline, and upbring your own children. The same way you love, you care for, and you take care of your children. If this is how you treat the orphans, then you're okay. So the Prophet said, Beginning at the age of seven, start teaching your children how to pray, even though it's not mandatory yet. But if at the age of 10, they are skipping prayers, they're not praying, then discipline them. This is for your own children. Likewise, for the orphans. Akhi, the virtue of looking after an orphan and taking care of them is unbeatable, not to be compared with anything else. And that's why when you're looking after an orphan, you feel like you have a jewel at home in your hand. It's a source of blessings for you. Ana wa kafilu yatimi fil jannati hakada. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, says, a person who sponsors and takes care or looks after an orphan will be so close to me, adjacent to me in paradise like these two fingers. And he pointed out with the uh, middle and the index finger. So this is how you should treat an orphan, like you treat your own children exactly, like you like to be treated yourself. Now with another hadith. The first hadith in chapter number 217 about the obligation of fasting and its excellence. A sound hadith agreed upon its authenticity and right away we see Abu Huraira radiallahu an introducing this hadith to us. Hadith number 1215. An Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu qal. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قال الله عز وجل كل عمل ابن آدم له إلا الصيام فإنه لي وأنا أجزي به والصيام جنة فإذا كان يوم صوم أحدكم فلا يرفث ولا يصخب 
فإن سابه أحد أو قاتله فليقل إني صائم والذي نفس محمد بيده لخلوف فم الصائم أطيب عند الله من ريح المسك للصائم فرحتان يفرحهما إذا أفطر فرح بفطره وإذا لقي ربه فرح بصومه رسول الله may the peace and blessings be upon him said the almighty Allah says every deed of son of Adam is for him except for fasting it is exclusively for me and I shall reward for it fasting is a shield and when one of you is fasting he avoids sexual relations with his wife and avoids quarreling if somebody should fight or quarrel with him he should say I'm fasting by the one in whose hand is my soul the unpleasant the unpleasant smell coming out of the mouth of a fasting person is better in the sight of Allah than the smell of musk and the fasting person will have two moments of joy one whenever he breaks his fast and the other when he meets his Lord then he will be pleased because of his fasting beautiful hadith we normally hear of we study every Ramadan and in preparation for Ramadan and also normally people ask what makes fasting a distinct worship because this is what the hadith says this hadith is highly sound highly authentic agreed upon its authenticity the almighty Allah said it's a hadith in Qudsi sacred hadith when you examine this segment you can present multiple questions and say what do you mean Ana ajizibah yani I'm the one who rewards for it isn't he the one who rewards for the prayers for the charity for any good deed we do yes he is the only one who rewards and he's the only one who punishes so why did he say about fasting Ana ajizibah I'm the one who rewards for it um, what about al siyamuli or all the deeds of son of Adam yani the good deeds are his but fasting is exclusively for me what does it mean that will explain the next segment with regards to the compensation or the reward the commentators of the hadith understood this segment as follows number one um, a person can claim that he's praying but he's not praying and a person can claim he paid his zakah but he never did but a person in public is fasting take a drink no I'm fasting but in reality he is not fasting and who would know whether he's fasting or not who maintains the condition of piety at home and behind closed doors as well as in public in front of people only al-mu'min correct al-munafiq al-munafiq can claim he's praying and he doesn't pray he's never been seen praying so if a person is truly fasting and he is not showing off then his reward of fasting is a ibadah which is exclusive for Allah unlike the rest of the ibadat one can claim that he did it but he did not do this is one reason why it is said that fasting is exclusively for me the second when you examine the tyrants who claim the lordship Fir'aun and the like of the Pharaoh and we examine the false deities which the polytheists and the non-believers have taken as gods instead of God or along with God then you examine their acts of worship not from among the ibadat or their worship fasting they may pray 
they may have to give a percentage of their uh, income or in charity or even perform some sort of pilgrimage revolve around the idols or seek help and invoke them but fasting no not a single tyrant not the pharaoh nor anyone else asked the people whom he fooled and claimed that he's the lord and creator he never asked them to fast it doesn't it would not benefit him he wants their money he wants them to bow down to him so the prayers bowing down prostrating themselves uh, giving taxes but fasting i'm not interested so only allah the only one who's worthy of worship has been truly worshiped through fasting but the rest of the ibadat uh, non-believers and those who associate partners to allah in worship they may worship through offering the prayers to other than allah they may do hajj to certain locations and give in a charity or certain percentage of their income but not fasting so fasting has this feature also in addition to the absolute sincerity which cannot be found except in fasting and that's why he says fasting is exclusively for me then he said fasting is a shield is a protection because when you fast is not only to stop eating and drinking in order to lose weight no to restrain your tongue to lower your gaze to guard your chastity so before you utter a word you think about it if you say something bad it can ruin your fasting i'm better off zip off your mouth i don't have to say it so you train yourself to do self-discipline and self-restraint that is the meaning of jannah wiqaya protection so whenever you're fasting please avoid al rafath al rafath in the quran refers to sexual contact with you with one spouse al sahab al fusuq which is quarreling fighting sinning cursing using abusive language even if you do not take the initiative somebody else is fooling around he addressed you with foolishness you're fasting you're not gonna do the same you're not gonna react with the same so just simply say i'm fasting if this person is muslim you say i'm fasting out loud in order to remind him and you hey we don't want to ruin our fasting otherwise you say it to yourself and also if it is a voluntary fasting you just say to yourself in your mind hey muhammad you're fasting you're not gonna ruin your fasting for this guy in order to uh, uh, avenge his foolish statement just keep quiet you're expecting the word from Allah Rasulullah swears I swear to the one in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad the, the smell of the mouth of a fasting person you know when you're fasting and you're not eating you're not drinking some people when they wake up first thing they do they have to brush their teeth why? Because when they were asleep, there is a bad smell that accumulated in their mouth. Maybe because they have a bad tooth or from their intestine, from their stomach, esophagus. So they have to begin by brushing their mouth, rinsing, uh, brushing their teeth and rinsing their mouth. So if you're fasting for 16 hours more or less, this smell is developed. It's offensive. But for Allah, He loves it. He doesn't go to smell it, but he loves it because it was developed and accumulated as a result of observing this great act of worship, which is fasting. Oh, okay, thank you, Sheikh. Now I don't have to brush my teeth. They didn't say so. You should brush your teeth and change the smell of your mouth because before Allah, you're known as fasting. Be before people, if you're speaking, you may offend them. It may create a bad smell so people would, you know, do not like to talk to you or come close to you so brush your teeth use the miswak even after asr and then finally the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says every person who observes fasting shall experience two delights two experiences of joy and delight the first is happened on daily basis and by the end of the month of ramadan on daily basis when you break your fast man you're happy you're hungry you're starving you're thirsty and now you get to drink so you like it you're happy even with ordinary food i just needed to drink some water you got it 
cold water because it was hot during the day, you got it, you're happy. And the second is the biggest delight, which is saved for you on the day of judgment when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you'll find the reward for fasting. One of the gates of heaven will be open wide for the fasting people only. The gate is named al rayyan All those who used to fast would be invited to enter through it. Then once they enter, it will be closed. And then the rest can find another door. Those who used to fast Ramadan and voluntary fasting as well. Brothers and sisters who have come to the end of today's episode of Gardens of the Pious to be continued inshallah next time again with the chapter of fasting. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah, Habib Allah, and only glory to him he born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them so why did they ignore that forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So Allah, Habib Allah